Facebook allegations came out in the fall um, again uh, by uh, Francis Hagan, who um, is, was the data analyst who, who testified before Congress that Facebook knew about the damage that some of its algorithms we're doing to um, uh, people on Instagram, people on uh, WhatsApp, people on Facebook, and they did nothing to mitigate some of these um, uh, some of these internal research conclusions that they found. And so we thought that maybe what we should do is have the humanities address some of these issues so that we as citizens, as consumers of social media, can can be more aware of what needs to be done and what needs to be addressed. And so I am super excited to welcome two professors from the School of Business who will help us through some of these issues because to me, the business school is so important in terms of addressing uh, how so many of you who will go into business will, will think ethically about how to manage some of the difficult situations that you may find yourselves in because you may find yourselves in a situation like Francis Hagen did at Facebook and not really know exactly how to address that. And so this is one reason why I've, um, I've brought on Dr. Salinas and <clears throat> Dr. Garcia. So I'm just gonna introduce Dr. Uh, Salinas and Garcia and then let them you know, run with the rest of it. And uh, we will have questions and answers, I guess, at, at the end, if you prefer, after yeah. both of your presentations. And then we can try to get into some discussion. I think that hearing your input would be really helpful. So uh, <clears throat> Dr. Salinas is a professor of business ethics and the department chair of management law and ethics at our School of Business. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on business ethics, women in management, corporate culture, and leadership. Her research focuses on understanding what motivates ethical behavior in a variety of contexts and appears in the Journal of Applied Psychology, the Journal of Business Ethics, the Journal of Business Ethics Education, the North American Case Research Journal, the Encyclopedia of Business Ethics, the Ivy Business School, and various books and conference proceedings. Um, she is currently working on two new streams of research, one of which focuses on how women and other marginalized groups in organizations can advocate for themselves, and the other seeks to understand how to motivate ethical behavior and empathy in the business classroom. In 2017, she was elected to a five-year term on the executive board of the International Association for Business and Society, where she currently serves as past president. She also reviews for various journals and conferences in her academic discipline and is North American editor of the Journal of Business Ethics Education. So she has received many awards, all of her publications that you, uh, selected publications that you can see on our website. Kristen uh, Hansen Garcia um, is an adjunct professor here in our School of Business. She previously served a 16 year tenure at the Oracle Corporation which is a 40 billion multinational company. As the global head and senior director of global organization and talent development, she led a team of experienced professionals from North America, Europe, Asia, and Latin America on various strategic organization development, leadership, and talent initiatives for Oracle's executive leaders, including its president. Kirsten also managed the Oracle Women's Leadership Initiative globally which included a biannual event at headquarters for 250 upper level managers and the ongoing development of over 60 Oracle women's leadership communities across the globe. Kirsten has led workshops and given keynote speeches at numerous conferences, including the Academy of Management, International Leadership Association and the Human Capital Institute. She was nominated by Oracle and selected to receive San Diego's YWCA Twin Leadership Award in 2011. She earned her doctorate from University of San Diego and received the William P. Foster Outstanding Dissertation Award for her dissertation on emerging elements of leadership in a complex system, a cognitivist approach. Her master's degree is from Northwestern University's Institute of Learning Sciences. Her bachelor's is from Indiana University. At USD, she co-designed and co-facilitated the Business Leadership and Spirituality Seminar Series 
for San Diego business leaders and served on the Dean Strategic Advisory Board in the School of Leadership and Education Sciences, which we of course know as Seoul. Kirsten has also been on the board at All Souls Episcopal Church and previously served on the board of Women's Empowerment, a nonprofit microfinance organization focused on giving small business loans to impoverished women in Ghana and for Touch. So please welcome Dr. Salinas and Garcia to speak for us today. Thank you. That made us, we're very busy. I know. We just, we're You're very busy. busy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we wanted to come to the Humanities Center because um, I think both of us are really passionate about sort of bridging the gaps across campus. Um, and I think it's really important to start, well, first of all, how many of you are business majors? How many of you are in the school business? Okay. Oh, <laughs> mo oh look at us teach, preaching to the choir. I love it. Okay. Um, so you probably know, and we hear it a lot of the time, business gets a bad rap sometimes, right? As the like, business is the cause for all of these problems. Um, and in some cases, that's completely true. Um, but both Kirsten and I also see business as a force for change. We see our business students as the people who are going to go out there and sort of shift the way things are done. So the kind of boo business approach doesn't work for us because it just doesn't make sense to us. Um, so we wanted to come at this from sort of the context of the school of business. And we're both super passionate about topics of women and organizations and the importance that we bring to organizations. Um, and so where we thought we'd start is by talking about how tech sort of operates in this very squishy gray area of business. And so Susie had mentioned, the earlier sessions were talking about Facebook. Um, and so we thought we'd talk a little bit about some of those tech platforms. Um, so Facebook, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Twitter, Instagram, right? All of these organizations, what are they, right? When you really think about it, what are they? And so earlier today, I was like, how would they explain themselves? And Facebook very specifically says, we are a platform. Okay, what does that mean, Mark Zuckerberg, right? It's just like, where's the platform? It's just like a magical thing that's out there. And they specifically say, we are not a publisher and we are not a media company. Okay, so you just are sort of, you're there. Um, and you have access to an insane amount of data, which comes with responsibility. Um, but what we're seeing is that Facebook and other platforms, they are not regulating themselves. They are not imposing any restrictions. If you look at, um, you know, like the bots that post on Facebook, right? The just misinformation, the trolls that are out there, all of this insanity that's out there, Mark Zuckerberg just goes, it's not us, it's just a platform, right? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, these companies sort of, um, they get away with a lot of stuff. They sort of slip through the cracks a little bit. Um, and when we were talking about this, it seemed pretty evident to us that the only concern that the people running these organizations have is the bottom line, right? It's not about protecting you. It's not about protecting me. It's not about protecting your crazy aunt who's still on Facebook and believes all of the misinformation that's on there. It is about them making money. And so Chris took my class and he knows that I am a huge proponent of this idea of you got to look at more than just the bottom line, right? Obviously, you have to make money. If you don't make money, you're bad at business and that doesn't make any sense, but you've got to take more into consideration. You've got to have something that you value be beyond that bottom line. And so it's pretty clear that these organizations aren't going to regulate themselves. So that's where the government comes in. And they're like, well, we have to regulate you. Um, but the government doesn't know what a platform is either. Um, if any of you saw the hearings where um, people from Congress questioned Zuckerberg, how would you describe those hearings? Atrocious. It was atrocious. <laughs> it was laughable. It felt very um, 
just like they they were so out of touch with what he did that if you don't know what he does how are you going to regulate what mm -hmm. he's doing how mm -hmm. are you going to protect us as consumers like there's just this complete disconnect um and so Kirsten's mm -hmm. going to talk a little bit about like should the government actually do that is this mm -hmm. their job mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. That's a great, great opening to kind of set the stage. And like um, Tara was saying that, you know, should the government regulate? Should companies regulate? Who's responsible here? And as we know that government is always playing catch up to new industries, like that's not unusual. When a new industry is created, invented, you have to kind of figure out the, the rules of the road. And so government's trying to understand that that's historical. So I do think we're in a little bit of a catch-up mode. Feel free to jump For in, sure, of course. Yeah. Um, we're in a catch-up mode trying to understand tech, right? Having said that, um, they better get on it from the government <laughs> standpoint because they've had a little while and they've just been sitting and you know debating different points, but they have to come to some kind of agreement or decision. I think it's been on, it's been long enough. I mean, it's been years, right, that we can start to put some guidelines in pay, place, some expectations, and some rules, laws um, to be held accountable legally. Um, on the other hand, from the, the standpoint of the businesses, um, obviously, as Tara said, you need to make a profit as a business. That's why you're in business. That's all important. But as with a lot of my students, we talk about this whole notion of enlightened self-interest mm -hmm. somewhat, that yes, it is also their self interest to be profitable, but also to take care of their customers and look out for the well-being of their customers. And so therefore, in the example of Facebook and Francis, who was the whistleblower and saying that, oh, we shouldn't maybe be guiding girls, teenage girls down pathways on Facebook to um, hear more about eating disorders or things that cause eating disorders. That's probably not the most responsible thing to do as a business, as Facebook, um, to be allowing that to happen, and so it is this whole enlightened self-interest. Ultimately, that if they they should be interested for their own sake, but also somewhat enlightened for the sake of that they're helping their customers too. But it ultimately will come back to bite them, I believe, in the long run, if if tech is not doing a better job of really being transparent and regulating itself. So. That takes moral leadership, though. It takes moral leadership on the government side. It takes moral leadership on the business side. Um, <clears throat> so there's that whole piece. I do think that there um, is a place, though, and as someone who's worked in tech, I've certainly saw this all the time. And you know, things were kind of kept purposely ambiguous, somewhat. So there's plausible deniability, as you've maybe heard that term, that you can kind of not necessarily be accused of something. So shall we say? Um, so there's a lot of gray, and I think it's purposeful gray a lot of times um, that tech has done. Again, tech has brought a lot of greatness to our life, but it also comes with, you know, the, the struggles. But having said that, us as citizens, um, and I think as college students and in a college environment, um, we have to be discerning citizens. We have to be critical thinkers. Um, Obviously, that's where the humanities aspect also comes in, in, into mind, as well as hopefully what we're teaching in the business school. But we do have to be responsible consumers of the information that we are being exposed to. And I do think we can have influence. Maybe it's, it's, a grass, it's considered grassroots, but when you have enough people over time, again, the strength in numbers, the continuing of, of growth of, of people that are concerned about a topic, you can make a shift. And it can be by your individual investments, your own investment portfolio of who you're investing in, if you're investing in companies like Facebook or you're not. Um, if you choose to invest in um, socially responsible businesses, um, such as benefit corporations or B Corps, which is becoming a bigger thing in more recent years. Um, California is one of the more leading states in this space that companies can be considered a B Corps, a benefit corporation. Companies like Patagonia or Ben and Jerry's or um, Etsy, they're all B Corps, right? So that can be a step too. And we can choose as citizens to invest in those organizations that we know are trying to be more responsible and are not beholden only to their bottom line, but their, their greater mission of something for humanity. 
So I think there's that big piece. And that's how we have capitalism, how we help capitalism actually work, right? Because if we're all taking more responsibility as citizens and we're encouraging those around us to do it, then I think that um, that's actually a more, a, that a, a more proactive capitalism or more responsible capitalism um, to, to take that into account. So I'll, I'll pause there if you want to. Well, and I think this sort of reminded me of, if you remember not that long ago, there was a huge um, outcry for delete Uber, right? Because Uber, much like Facebook, had a whistleblower, also a woman. Uh, she blew the whistle because uh, Uber's corporate culture was vile um, and no one listened to her complaints. Also, there were calls to delete Facebook, right? Because they were sort of um, just taking data by infiltrating accounts through fake quizzes, right? So like people have sort of mm -hmm. heard the cry, um, but we still haven't gotten to the tipping point to where um, these people are actually listening. Um, and so I think a lot of times under the guise of capitalism, I always joke with my students, right? People are like, oh, the market, the market will take care of it. Like the market <laughs> is this just like nebulous mom who's hugging everyone and making it all fine. Like the market can't correct for everything. And ethics isn't common sense. And I think that's one of the assumptions as well, is that just like, well, I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg, and I feel that I'm, no, I don't feel bad for picking on Mark Zuckerberg. I don't, um, right? Like, oh, well, he's just going to be ethical eventually. He'll figure it out. Um, but Ethics isn't common sense. If ethics was common sense, um, we would have, right now we would have so many fewer shows to watch on Netflix. Everything that is good on Netflix now is based around somebody who made terrible ethical decisions, right? The dropout. Elizabeth Holmes, she's just a liar. She was a very good liar, but she was a liar. Uh, the inventing Anna, Anna Sorkin, Anna Delvey, whatever her name is, right? Just a grifter, just a sketchy ethics. There's there are shows on a, what do we have? There's a, a new fire festival one. There's a, there's an Uber one. There's a, we work one. Honestly, anything you watch on TV that you're like, Ooh, this is good. It's thanks to ethics or a complete <laughs> lack of it. Um, right. Like that's, that's what's going on. So this assumption that all of these people are all of a sudden you'd be like, Oh my gosh, I just realized I am being completely unethical. Like that is not, it's not going to happen. Um, what they may do to sort of make themselves feel better is to start a foundation, mm. right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, but look, I made a foundation though. My foundation does such good stuff. So if you could look at that and not pay attention to what I'm actually doing over <laughs> here, that would be great. There's a lot of sort mm -hmm. of deflection, but mm -hmm. I love people throwing money at problems where those, those like groups wouldn't have gotten that attention. That's great, but that's not gonna fix the problem. Um, what they actually need is better leadership. Um, when you think about um, Mark Zuckerberg as a leader, how would you describe him? What are his leadership traits? A thumbs down, right? Like, I'm just like a guy in a sweatshirt who kind of mumbles. Like, that's, that's not, like, what does he do? There is nothing that he is doing that would indicate to investors or people who use Facebook or Instagram um, that he is doing really anything that well. He's clearly great at the back end of the tech side of Facebook and that's great, um, but tech impacts actual human beings, right? And that, there seems to be a disconnect there. Um, and th there needs to be this sort of internal accountability. And so where we think that internal accountability is gonna come from is a shift in who works in tech. And if you look at any of the stats of who works in tech, it's not ladies, right? It's, it's, it's sorry, sorry, dudes. It's a bro <laughs> culture, right? Like it is mostly men working in tech. And if you only have the opinion and the background of half of your society, you are missing out on a lot of other important things in the workplace. Um, so Kirsten's going to talk a little bit more about why we need women in these leadership roles in tech. Right. And, um, and so I think it, you know, completely agree with what Tara was just sharing. And, you know, the question is, you know, we need better leadership. So do we need more women? And that's not to say that all women are good leaders, Correct. um, because we, 
in my classes, we talk about this a lot too. Men and women, no matter what your gender, you can be a great leader. Doesn't, doesn't matter, right? There might be a few more hurdles that some women face, especially in the tech industry. Right. Um, and so if we can increase that number though, um, I think it can have a positive effect overall. So the simple question of, do we need more women in leadership roles in tech? Yes, I think that's, that's a, a good straightforward way. But I think it's more nuanced than that. I think it's that we also need the traits, the characteristics, the skills, um, the life experiences that we, that we might more typically or traditionally associate with women the feminine, but it doesn't mean that regardless of your gender, you can't also embrace those, those, uh, those aspects, those characteristics. So for example, if women are more typically, again, not all women, I, I, I never believe it's like all or none type of thing, but not all women, but, but many women are more relational, let's say, or more collaborative in the way they want to approach something. Um, that would be a very useful characteristic to have more of in tech. Right. If you were, if you're more relational, you're understanding your impact on the other. And with technology, it would be helpful to understand your impact on the other through using your platform or those who are using your platform. So that would be something that would be very helpful. Um, obviously, also the collaboration piece. I really still believe fundamentally that you get better solutions at our output when you do collaborate. Not to say that men don't collaborate because they do. Um, but there's a little bit more of an inclusion element that often comes with women being involved and therefore in men who I think who are enlightened to understand, who understand that, that can actually get you better solutions too. Um, and just the equity piece, um, certainly as we talk about in my classes, but just in general equity, when there is more representation from different types of people, we, we start to see things in a little bit more fair way. Um, and I think all of these things would be very, very beneficial to the tech industry uh, and, and something that should be really encouraged. Now, it's hard to break through on some of that because there's recruiting still of, we recruit those who were like. Um, and so when there's not a lot of women in tech, um, you know, you can see why there's not as many women that go into tech, right? So anyway, so that's something I think to, to, to consider it. It's not just the fact that we need more women, it's that we need more of the attributes and the characteristics that we typically associate with the feminine. We still need the masculine. We still need that, um, if you wanna call it power or competition or all those types of things. That's all still great. That can be very healthy and useful. Um, so I think we need that balance. And right now it's just very unbalanced. And I think that this is um, absolutely possible. Um, and I do think that we can do this. We just have to choose to do this and we have to encourage that behavior and expect that behavior of this industry. Um, and that will imperfectly help us get to being more ethical. Yeah, and I, I think if you, if you think about tech in general or Silicon Valley, um, who, who do you look to as a good leader, let alone as a good female leader. So there's just sort of this vacuum of examples for people to, to look to. And so to Kirsten's point, you end up with this, well, you look like me and you have my experience. So I assume you're going to be just as awesome as I am. Yes. I'm going to hire you, right? Like that's how we end up sort of replicating each other in organizations. So part of what we really need too is just better training. But part of what happens in companies like Facebook and in the startup world is think about it. It's like two friends who have an idea, right? And they're just like, oh, we, have, we got funding. We have an idea. This is awesome. Um, nobody's going like, what sort of leadership training should we have? What should our culture be like? Who should we respect? Right? Like, no, they're like, we don't have time for this. We are grinding 20 hours a day. We sleep in our office and Elizabeth Holmes just subsided on green juice. Right, like we don't have time to think about that stuff. And so what happens is these companies, they get funding and the number of employees that they have just explodes. And that foundational piece is never laid down. And so it's not as if Mark Zuckerberg and the Uber guy are, are 
out to make bad decisions. They just want to make money. And so when that's the focus, all of these other pieces of what good leadership should look like no longer matters, right? In their minds, the good CEO is the CEO who just makes the decision, right? And doesn't take anything else into consideration. And so like I was saying before, when you've got, when, when you're missing out on the opinions of 50% of the population, right? This whole idea of like, the, the whole sort of sub threads that are out there on eat, disordered eating for teenage girls. I feel like that might've been cut mm -hmm. earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Like we all sort of see the damage that social media is doing. And it's only in the last few years that tech companies have started to report their internal diversity numbers. And they're not even doing that um, because they want to, right? They've essentially been shamed into doing it um, as a result of the crazy Google screed that came out. The Google engineer who was like, ladies can't be engineers because of their lady brains. They just can't do it. And people were like, that, what? You can't say that. Mm -hmm. um, and so Google was like, sorry, sorry, sorry. Look at, we have all, look at all the ladies that we have and they've made beautiful charts and graphs. And it was like, good job, Google, that you have 4% women. Good. And then the next year they were like, look at us now, it's 4.2, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, so it, part of it is good that these things have been sort of um, like a light has been shown mm -hmm. on them, but yeah. now is when the change needs to happen. And that's going to come from from people like some of this. A lot of times newer employees just keep their heads down and they just want to keep their job, which yes, that makes sense. Um, but if you don't want to work in a company that doesn't respect the rights of its consumers and probably its employees, like some shift has to happen. And mm -hmm. so I think like this whole idea of humanizing business mm -hmm. is really important. So it's not just about hiring more women. It's about acknowledging that the people who work for you are, are people mm -hmm. and your customers are people. So when you're looking at them just as data points, you are missing some really key pieces of information. And that I think is what is driving some of this unethical behavior that is out there. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, and I mean, we all use, we all, like, come on, we all use all of the time, right? Like I, Zuckerberg is terrible. Am I on Instagram? Oh yeah, obviously. Like what, where else will I entertain myself for several hours a day? Um, right. And like we, and this is, I'm part of the problem here. I am, I'm an ethics professor and I'm like <laughs> on Instagram reels, right. But so we the point you were making, I think that um, first, I, I want to say again, it's the whole thing of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You've heard that phrase too. There are a few tech companies that are trying to figure it out. Like Salesforce is an example, is trying to do some yeah. good leadership development yeah. stuff, right? And they're Benioff, Mark Benioff, actually used to be at Oracle. He's doing some things to really support some of his employees and grow in, a, I think, a more positive way there. But that, those are the exceptions. Yeah. They're not, it's not the norm. Right and if now. you notice those exceptions aren't in the news. Yes. Nobody's like, you know, who's awesome today? Oracle. Right. They're, gr they're doing great. Like yeah. good companies doing good stuff and making good decisions isn't good news. Right. Right. So we just don't hear about we it. We don't hear about it. And it's not, it's not the norm, right? It's just not as many to, to, to that, to your point. And then the other piece that you were saying, Tara, or as far as, um, feeling like, um, you know, that you can maybe raise an issue. I'll say that like you've, you're a new hire and you can't necessarily, um, you don't maybe feel comfortable bringing something up, right? But hopefully as, as you continue to grow in your responsibilities and management responsibilities and so on, you do feel like you have um, the voice to do that. But I would say it's also about trying to create ecosystems that allow for this kind of dialogue to happen. Cause there's not those ecosystems, there's not a lot of them right, right now. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the places those ecosystems are developing are through like employee resource groups. Mm -hmm. So as yeah. you're looking at organizations, as you're applying for jobs, they call them, usually they're like ERGs, right? And to me, that's a signal that the company cares about more than the bottom line, because mm -hmm. they're willing to put at least some money into supporting people who are not 
traditional members of their organization, right? Mm -hmm. So like, is there a women's group? Is there a group for members of the LGBTQ community? Is there a group for Spanish speaking employees, right? Those are signals. Um, I don't know if Facebook has those. I don't know. They may. Um, I don't know if anybody has time to go to them because they work all of the time. Um, right. But like, there are, there are signals, there are things that are, that are happening, but the, the process has been really slow and kind of disappointing, especially when you think about how fast tech moves, right? So like the process is just as slow as the government is on trying to figure out what in the world to do with these platforms. Right. Right. Exactly. And, you know, and this really is, um, going back to that term, the enlightened self-interest, this is in the interest of these companies to be more ethical and to make wiser decisions and be more concerned about their consumers and their users. And especially when we see so much unrest in our world, right? In different countries. I mean, and I know Tara, you had pulled yeah, up recently I was just gonna the, pull it up. in Russia. Have like you the- seen, there's a list online. So a Yale professor, I have it right here, put together a list of and he basically um, graded companies from A to F. So A, the companies were like, uh, Russia, what? No, we're out. Like we're pulling all of our operations out. Mm-hmm. And then there are companies, um, the B grade is they're, they're keeping options open to maybe go back, but they've left. Um, there are companies who are um, reducing their current operations some that are holding off new investments. And then category five, the F, um, they're categorizing them as digging in. Demands like they're not, they're staying there no matter what. And this is where, you know, social media is really useful. Mm-hmm. To, to, and like Kirsten was talking about social investing, putting your mm-hmm. money behind companies that you really care about. So just as a completely random aside, um, I was looking up, socially screened portfolios for investment the other day. And you know how, when you look up an investment, you can see all the companies that are listed in it, right? So I was like, oh, this fund looks great. And I clicked it and the top company listed in it was Nestle. And I was like, Nestle is terrible. Like Nestle has done heinous things in the past. And they were the biggest group of holdings in this socially screened portfolio, right? So like, you do have to do your homework. And I think a lot of us are, we're tapped out right? Mm -hmm. You're in school, we're working, we have kids, like it's, you just, you run out of time, but that's how these companies get away with this stuff, Mm -hmm. right? It's just by us going like, oh, fine, Zuckerberg, I'm scroll your wheels, right? Like that's part of what is driving this. So, you know, I think all of us have to do a little bit better for For this to change yeah I agree and um, options um that it, it you know it doesn't bode well for the long term right and it is in our own it is in an organization in the company's self-interest to to be responsible and be ethical um and not encourage um you know if we're talking about russia or whatever you know violence and all of these things i mean that that is ultimately not sustainable or good for humanity right and you can pick any country in the world and whatever you want to whatever you want want to issue you want to take there there can be issues in many countries right and even just understanding it democracies themselves while they are beautiful and amazing and you know these wonderful experiments right there is this whole self-regulating a little bit right in democracy and I think sometimes we don't realize those in, uh, those of us in the Western world um, how important that is that we do pay attention uh, because even companies that operate in China, for example, I mean they're not a democracy. Um, they have capitalism elements, but they're not democracy, so so to speak. And they are the government is involved in every single company that exists there. I mean, you have to have governmental roles. And I know when I would go over there for business, um, literally, we were working with attorneys that worked for our company at the time, Oracle, but they were educated like Duke Law School and all that, you know, go back to China, work in the companies there, and they have to be the liaison with the Chinese government in order to even operate and function as a business. So if you want democracies to to remain um thriving and also to have companies thriving and companies to have independence somewhat, 
you have to make sure the democracy is doing well. Like they both go hand in hand. You can maybe, I don't know if you can say that better, but they, they both are connected. And, and I think sometimes we forget that. Um, and so I think that goes back to our ethical responsibility, yeah. um, both as companies, as individuals, and then as a democracy to understand how we allow that to happen. Um, otherwise, we won't have democracies and we will have co countries that are controlling companies much more often. And if the, if the panel by our senators is any indication of what that control might look like, we are, we're gonna have a problem, right? So like something, something's gotta shift. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to make sure that like you get to ask questions. Yeah. This was just sort of Kirsten and I's take on the tech platforms and sort of what, what can be done better, but like, we're happy to answer questions about women in tech ethics. I don't know, Instagram reels, like whatever, you know. We're hanging out, yeah. I just hear you say that this issue goes back to the early 90s when Congress passed an act basically holding the platforms not responsible for what the computer is on. I mean, in the 90s, these platforms didn't even exist. So I think what's happening is the platforms are using really dated rules as a justification, right? That's one way that they can just be like, oh, well back in the, like was Zuckerberg even alive in the nineties? Probably, but like he was a baby, right? Yeah. Like, so I think that it's just that they are operating in such a, in such a kind of wild west well, right now. My, my point is just that they can legally do this based on an Well, and so on a, on so many of these platforms, right, those people are, we don't actually know who they are. And your question brought up a point that I make in my classes a lot, which is the, the difference between something being legal and something being ethical, right? Right, like they can do it and they can, but can you sleep at night, yeah. right? And like Zuckerberg probably can't because he probably has very nice sheets because he is very rich, but um, like, because you can do it, should you do it? Yeah, and I, and I will just tell you as someone who's worked in tech and not that I have insight onto everything, but that is a much more common dilemma than I think is really appreciated as far as what is ethical and mm -hmm. what is legal. And I'm not gonna get into any specifics, but, um, but those kind of um, challenges um, come up continually. And I, I guess not that I'm perfect and have it all figured out either, but I have a fairly strong ethical bone in me or bones in me. And so sometimes you see things that you're just like, wait a second, you're trying to get away with this and, but it's legal, but is that, that's not really being true to what you're supposed to, it's not in the spirit of the law. It might be the letter of the law, but it's right. not in the spirit of the law. Well, and I think there's a lot about, right. Sometimes the the law takes a while to catch up yes. to what we as a society deem as ethical. Yeah. Right. Like the law is slow. It is molasses trying to catch up to yeah. what is actually happening. And so when you add the complex the complexity of tech on top of that, mm -hmm. like it just becomes kind of a quagmire. Your hand was up. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For an example, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Joe Rogan's podcast. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, time series. Yep. He sees politicians on the street. They're taking out their time series and then that's just on track. Well, find out yeah. Like seven months later, the people who use it for health care perspective are talking to the people. So I just, I, I find it hard to, like, I, I'm, I'm not saying what my brother did is what is right by any means, by any frequency of right. Too much attention to the news, you're misinformed, so you don't pay attention to anything. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, you're literally like you just became a philosophy major. Yes. Um, yeah. Right, because this is the like, okay, so this is this is ethical according to who? Yeah. Who draws the line? And I right. think that's the question that tech companies just do. Platforms like Facebook, which is now meta, you know, because like rebrands mm -hmm. fix everything. Yeah. They're just like, oh, no, thank you. We do nope, we're not going to touch that at all. And they don't have, it is impossible to monitor all of the content all mm -hmm. of the time. And I mean, so then I guess my question is, when did you take that responsibility on the user? Like, how, how do you respond to the user that way? That are you going to raise my voice about this thing? I can be subjected to that decision to write it because you say you need information from someone as far as the contact that I report to the platform. I just don't. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I think that's fair. I yeah. understand that point, and yeah, and it is it's a balance, or maybe if there's even more, I don't know, tutorials or educational tools to try to help the users understand how to discern, be discerning users. Maybe it's things like that. I mean. You're making me think, this Sebastian, um, is, is, um, from my class. So um, I think it's a really good point, and I think we, um, I think if we, if maybe part of this whole thing is we have to help our citizens become more knowledgeable at, at, at deciphering information and being better consumers of information, and you know, and maybe that's part of what the tech companies have to do, you know, as far as their responsibility. I do think that. Um, the whole disinformation, dis and misinformation thing. Um, well, okay, so first of all, I'll say the civics education. So on this analysis recently that I um, read and saw, I think it's like 50 cents um, is, uh, is sent, spent a year on a, for every student, let's say, on civics education compared to about $56 in STEM topics. Um, is what they're saying like i'm talking about like high school high school students and i say that because there's a big link between being more civically educated and knowing your responsibilities as a as a citizen and to be discerning consumers of information and we've really gone downhill on that in our country uh, and, and i'm sure it's not just our country uh, others too because there's been so much focus on stem stuff which the stem is great no no question but we need to understand that we have to be critical thinkers right and so there's there's a big push this um series that i heard was on department of um, homeland security um experts who have been in previous administrations as well we're talking about this and how there's this big push to now increase the attention on civics education and understanding our roles as citizens and the one other quick thing i will say to this on the whole understanding information and who's responsible who isn't if we are all trying to become better at it and you're encouraging you know your friends to do that too I think that's a big step. We also have to learn, and my husband actually has a background in the military with disinformation in, in information operations, okay? And I won't go into all of that, but it's very, very involved. And there are very intentional information operation campaigns that happen that we don't even know that we are experiencing, right, in our society. Well, and it's just got very interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, well, and, and it's a lot more than just dis and, it, dis and misinformation. Those are important pieces of it, but it's even more complex than that, which my husband can't even tell me all that stuff, right, because based on what he, it's classified. Um, but I say this because one thing he always tells me and suggests, and this is just good research, as you know from academia, is triangulating things. Yeah. You have to go look at more than one source. Mm -hmm. So you can't just take that, read one thing and think, okay, I, I trust that source. Maybe you do tend to trust that source and you know it follows journalistic standards, but go check it a few other places to actually validate that it's accurate. Uh, so and that's that what we're not doing, right? Yes, because right. we don't have time, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, I think to your question about removing content, that's really hard. Like I, I was, as, as you were asking that, I was thinking about, we have this whole thing in academia that's called academic freedom. Right, that as a professor, you're like, I'm going to do what I want, and you can't do anything about it. Right, but like, should you, right, should you be allowed to have hate speech on a public platform? And people are going to argue for free speech. I think a lot of this is just like we've sort of devolved as a society, and we're not as good at being people anymore. Right, like, just sort of general humanity isn't 
something that is considered as often. So I don't think anybody has an answer for that question. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of these platforms are sort of, they're trying to, they're like, oh, we're going to pull everything down. And people are like, no. And then they're like, mm -hmm. we're going to leave it up. And other people are like, terrible. They just can't like, it's so squishy right now. It's really a moving target. Your hand was up and then Chris. Yeah. So um, the ways the algorithms for like these, like Instagram, TikTok have been programmed just to um, like keep users on for as long as possible. Right. The only focus, like stuff about, oh, you know, if, if it's showing content that's not, you know, good for like the well being of people, don't show that. Like that, I don't really think that exists. Mm -hmm. So how would you recommend if we had tech leaders in the room to make their platforms more ethical while not losing fun? Because let's say they did, you know, do something about those eating disorders and, you know, bad stuff like that, which shouldn't happen. They would lose money because people would be on the, um, it would be on the platforms less. You know, like those mm -hmm. girls would be on the platform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's all ad revenue. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions? Ugh, I'm like, oh, another growth app will just pop up that is like directly targeting those people, right? Like it's right, right. Because from a business perspective, that's good business, right? right. You don't want to lose the funds. Mm -hmm. But I also think it comes to a point where do you want to make money at the expense? of sort of being a good person. Mm -hmm. And some people will be like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I will be sat on my yacht, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I, it's a, mm, it's a really tricky, I don't know, Kirsten, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, it is, does go back to, I mean, I guess at the, how are we, what are we valuing as we grow up and as we're conditioned and our ethics and our humanity, as you keep saying, and our civics education, our responsibility to other, you know, um, it's not just responsibility to self, it is responsibility to other and as a society in order for a society to truly keep functioning. Um, so I, I, it's, these, it's complex and I, I don't know, I guess you just have to go back to that enlightened self-interest a little bit when you're talking to the tech leaders and say, hey, ultimately is this sustainable? Because you're gonna be found out. That's you're true. you're going to be found out. Well, and also, as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, technically these, a lot of these platforms are supposed to be for particular age groups, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, once true. you get to be 18, technically you're an adult, right? And you should be able to look at whatever you want. So there probably shouldn't be anybody monitoring what you're looking at, right? But if they, if they were maybe better at sort of parsing access by age, that might because mm -hmm. it's, I think a lot of our concern comes from like the, the social media influence on younger kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. 11 and 12 year olds are on, nine year olds are on TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. So like, and I think, aren't you supposed to be like 13 to have a TikTok account? Like, I think there is a lower, right? And so I, it's stuff like that where there are, there are rules in place and the rules aren't necessarily, they're not upholding their own rules. Mm -hmm. Right. So they sort of started by being like, oh, okay, if we if we put in the age limits, we'll be fine. Um, and that I don't know that they're actually checking that sort of stuff. And then as a parent, right, it comes back to like, well, why is your kid on TikTok? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, because kids are shady, right? Like they just they figure out ways to be on things. And it's again back to your like, well, so who's responsible? Right. Like it's this is why ethics is fun. It's yeah. just who knows? Yeah. It's just a mess. That's why you should all take ethics classes yeah, totally. all of the time. Yeah, Chris. So I think this is more of a comment than a question, but it's just about your point. Like these tech companies have proven that they have a lot of power in terms of like public opinion, mm -hmm. they're able to shape narratives by getting rid of information that to promote um, what they want to do as a business or as a company. Yeah. But Yeah. If you, if you kind of uh, content, 
Mm -hmm. That's a nice rebrand. <laughs> Content supervisor. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think. Well, and that's where I think both Kirsten and I don't think that this is a place that government should be trying to fix because it's too complex. This is mm -hmm. why we think it's got to be mm -hmm. internal. Right. Like they have to be self-motivated to fix this stuff um, because drawing these lines is, is almost impossible, right. right? And you're sort of saying like the, so how, how do you decide whether it's, this is unacceptable for us as a society, or I just don't like this, mm -hmm. right? And man, it is it is not easy. Excuse me. Oh, yay. Oh, hey. <laughs> Right. Well, and just to further on that on that point, because you're you're spot on, especially in tech, a lot of times you are promoted. This is not unique just to that industry, but you're promoted based on your technical skills or your functional skills, not necessarily your leadership skills, right? So if you're doing something well, something innovative in the tech space, then you may get more responsibility, but you don't really know how to lead people. And that's part of the problem because that does happen all the time. We had, I mean, that was a continual problem at when I was at Oracle. So you're always trying to develop more aware, self-aware and um, better leaders, of course, but you're right, it's difficult. and. I don't think it's an, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I mean, it has to, you have to address it more throughout the whole organization and try to start when they're, when they're young, when they're new, right? Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question at all. Well, I also think there, so if you think about who's running tech companies, there aren't a lot of women to go to for mentorship mm -mm. as a female founder, for example, right? No. So. I listened to the dropout podcast. I'm now watching it on Hulu, right? And you see it and there's, she has nobody to turn to and she's a terrible leader. She had an idea and then mm -hmm. like everything went awry mm -hmm. and she was unwilling to listen to people. But if you're gonna found a company, you gotta still be good at business, right? Like you can't be a dictator and think that that's gonna work all of the time, right? So you need a mentor who will say like, hey, you don't have this skill and you need to bring somebody in who actually can fill that void, right? I think a lot of the, a lot of what happens in startups is you get a few people doing everything, right? Or the founder is like, no, I got it, I got it, I'll do that too. I am HR, I am ops, I will also unclog toilets. Like I'm doing everything and like nobody has the skills to do all of those things. As it is, a CEO is a ridiculous group of skills that you need to have in order to do really well in that. So until there are more like female mentors or even male mentors willing to take on female startup founders and be like, hey, mm -hmm. 
you got to do better. It's, it's just not going to happen, right? Because their focus is so much more on leveling up their product, the next round of funding. And that sort of core components of business, like literally the core business classes that we force you all to take, like that gets ignored because so many of these tech startups, Elizabeth Holmes wasn't a business major, right? So you, you come from the sciences, you have no business foundation and you're trying to all of a sudden like figure out HR problems and payroll, like it just doesn't translate. Yeah, yeah, Elizabeth, don't drop out. Finish, graduate from USD and you will be in a much better position. Mm -hmm. It's like we did that on purpose or something, my gosh. <laughs> right. Did I miss a hand? I feel like there was another, is there another question? Yeah. Uh, I have like an idea and response to that. Um, in Italy, the, at least the startup and the like the most paid is like this is what's happening. Yeah. Here. Right. Um, and you know, that gives you a better perspective because there's a lot of rich people that know a lot that are like, you know, <laughs> but, Chris, you now have a career set up. You yeah. can coach these people to do this. But yeah, like that, there's something missing in the framework mm -hmm. of these companies. And you're right. If you've got the cash, right, and you're putting it in, do you want to invest a bunch of money into somebody who has a great idea and zero business acumen? Right. Like that's a that's a real big gamble. Right. But but it happens, right? Yeah. And and I don't know what the latest data is on it, but so little VC money goes towards. Oh, it's like two percent yeah, of VC and, money and it goes to women. Yeah, and minorities, I think. Yeah. Right. So it's just, it, but that would make a big difference. I mean, that really, really would, um, as far as having more of those skills. And I, again, I think what is it? Warren Buffett is famous for saying he did so well because he only was competing against half the population, right? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's something to, to, to consider just going back real quickly. I'm kind of thinking out loud on this point yeah. around what's going to, I think it's been from a few questions, like what's going to help them change or help all of us shift in our, in our society. And I keep thinking about when organizations or companies are causing harm and you think back to even the, the cigarette industry, right? And so let's just take other industries, right? What we've learned from, and again, I'm not the expert on exactly how that all came about, but things shifted with them, laws shifted. We learned that secondhand smoke was detrimental to people. I think California was like the first state or one of the first states to not allow you to have secondhand smoke, you know, smoking in restaurants and bars and so on. And I, I actually was even back in Chicago at the time. And like, that wasn't, it's awful because you get it in your clothes and everything, right? But that shifted over time because about causing harm to other people and in that industry, um, even alcohol somewhat, we've, we've, we've come along there too. So maybe I'm having wishful thinking, but I'm hoping we get to a point of understanding how technology does cause harm to people. And we're putting laws and regulations and guidelines in place to lessen that chance of harm, right? Um, again, maybe I'm too hopeful. No, I just wrote down. I mean, I think that's a really good point. What kind of harm are we gonna try and avoid moving forward, right? Because, and I mean, even when I think about lesser impacts, like the dress codes that used to exist for women in organizations, mm -hmm, right? Like right. Oh, pants, absolutely not. You will wear pantyhose and a skirt because mm -hmm. that is what ladies do, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. enough people were finally like that, no, I'm not gonna do that, right. Right? right? So like these shifts happen, but right now they are so slow. And it's, I think in the framework of tech, we see stuff happen so quickly that it's really frustrating to watch like all this other stuff happen and still like nobody's really taking responsibility or accountability and kind of to your point, right? Because Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have to. He's like, well, I didn't post it. Your, your mom posted it, right? Like, and you can't go like, you, you can't go and sue all of these individuals. It's just not possible. Yeah. yeah. That's a great yes. point. Yeah, correct. 
more helpful. And then in the responsibility list, you know, it must fall on the consumer or the yeah. user to say, have the knowledge of what's going on. Yeah. Um, and check for the complete subject and build it up and get the brand name. Not so many people would like to get the brand name if they don't know the marketing. Yeah, right. Well, and I think that what problem, like problems like this, solutions come from it. And those solutions are like new avenues for you all in mm -hmm. terms of careers. So yeah. like data privacy now, yeah, nobody cared about data privacy like five years ago, right? Like, which is why Mark Zuckerberg has all of our information. Everyone was like, right. I'll take that quiz, right? Now it's like, it's a huge avenue. Like we, I think yeah. we actually have like an online degree in data privacy now, right? Like, so mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. privacy at Qualcomm pays half my mortgage because that's what my husband does, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Like, I mean, uh -huh. like I'm seeing this in my own house and it's like, oh, mm -hmm. wow, companies, they're starting to get it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a slow, it's a slow burn right mm -hmm. now. But I think all of these sort of frustrating problems are all opportunities for you all as you go into the workplace to be like, Absolutely. I've been on the outside. I see this and it needs to change. And, you know, when you finish school, which again, don't drop out, um, no. there's an opportunity to do that. And could I just say something? And don't yeah. you think that also means what's socially acceptable as well for, for, sure. for human systems? Like if, as that starts to shift and we say, oh no, we don't want to cause harm in that space anymore then it starts to be like, we all start to coalesce around that as just as people. And then right. frankly, Sorry. something Sorry. new and terrible will pop up yes. that we have to figure out, no. right? Because yeah. that's just how society works. Ex exactly. Sorry, Aiden. No, no, it's okay. So I guess my, um, what I want to talk about, um, kind of go off of Sebastian said, these companies, we think that these companies should be more transparent. But I think what I'm thinking about if they were more transparent, we would realize how bad of companies they really are. <laughs> and then well, because cigarette companies, mm -hmm. if we ask them to be more transparent, it's like this is a horrible thing for our society. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly think the same thing would happen with TikTok for sure, in my opinion, and probably Instagram and Facebook. Maybe, but there's more kind of family. But I guess my question is, when we know there's a company that is total net bad for society, like a smoking company, TikTok, what do we do? It's <laughs> like, you're not going to... You got to delete TikTok. I you got to stop right. trying to do the dances. Like, I don't, I mean, you just got to, you got to quit. But... Yeah. But let's face it, well, how are we gonna do that? but really? social media, how social media and smoking are both pretty similar in a lot of ways, right? They're addictive. They're bad for your brain. They're, they make you sit on your couch for a long time, right? Like they're, mm -hmm. but we're just, we're not willing to do it because the, I think part of why people were willing to sort of like get rid of smoking is we had more data. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. have the data. Mm -hmm. yet yes um yes. like we know like studies are happening and people are like this seems bad it seems especially bad for teenagers mm -hmm. kids in middle school right but like it hasn't amassed to the point of the smoking data where it was like this kills people so yes uh, i mean have social media has definitely had like actual ramifications in people's lives but i think the the sort of degree of it isn't quite as severe which is why people haven't been willing to just sort of cut it off yeah it's what yeah right yeah also there are very great cat videos here right. you know i mean the social dilemma that movie yeah yeah Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, like there's, there are good parts to all of this. So mm -hmm. just sort of, which makes it cigarettes, difficult. there were no good things yeah, yeah. to the cigarettes, right? Whereas with this, there are some benefits, like 
when I think about one of the biggest things that especially mm -hmm. since the pandemic that's happened because of social media is the acknowledgement of the need to take care of your mental health. Mm -hmm. That discussion on social media, on Instagram, on TikTok, especially from younger people is happening in ways that just even when I was in my 20s didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yes. But then some of the other stuff is like just so terrible. Yes. Yeah. I mean, isn't that yes. ironic? Yeah. Yeah. But at the same, yeah, you like are scrolling forever, but then it's like, maybe you're scrolling because you're depressed and people are like, oh, right. right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Or watch cat videos. Like, you know, there are yeah. things. Uh, none of the ladies have asked any questions. Do any of the ladies in the audience have any questions? Cause you need to go to Silicon Valley and just kick in the doors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think both of us in our women in management classes, I always start the class by saying like, this isn't a class about like men are terrible. Like mm -hmm. men are, men are part of the solution, right. but it has to be smart dudes who realize like, oh, we seem to be excluding you. No one is listening to you. Right. Like this is, it has to be like sort of everybody is in on this. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the one of the trickiest things for women is we see a room full of dudes and we're just like, Ooh, I don't know if I want to work there. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it immediately like that. So it needs to like the, the sort of the type of culture needs to shift a little bit. Um, and I think you also just have to kind of not worry about what people say and right. kind of get in there anyhow. I mean, what do you tell your students and women in management? Yeah, similar. Um, I men are great advocates and allies as well, and I think our, you know, it's all all that. And I th I would say just this is true for anyone, woman or man, but being confident, you know, know your stuff, know whatever your specialty is, whatever your functional background is, know it, be good at it, be strong, lead with your, you know, with your gifts, your talents that you're going to be able to contribute. Um, and hold your own and speak up. Um, and, you know, Cheryl Sandberg, that's the whole mess, messy thing I know, but in her book, <laughs> Lean In, she does at least talk about, even though she's at Facebook, but she does say, sit at the table, you know, sit at the table, speak up and make a point and don't be hesitant in making those points, even if not everyone's going to agree, but have a voice. And I mean, I would say this to anyone, but especially women in those, in, in, in that space. Um, just, you have to be confident and you have to be assertive in doing it. Um, and there's no reason, I mean, even if someone gives you a hard time and I certainly had, you know, that experience myself in, in technology at Oracle. So, you know, just keep going and, and push back where you think you need to push back, hold your own, hopefully with dignity and respect. Um, I don't think you have to play the game that some others play. Um, but you also have to know there's consequences with that too, but that's the only way we're going to make progress is if we continue to try to be the workers and leaders we think we can be. Well, and I, <laughs> I do want to say, I say this in my, specifically in my women in management class. Okay. You all are coming out of college and you have learned a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff that the people hiring you don't know. Right. Right. Think about who's going to hire you right? These people are going to be 30, maybe 40 years older than you. You have a, you have a knowledge base and you need to sort of claim that. And I think what happens a lot, especially for women is this whole like imposter syndrome. Like I'm, I'm only 22. Maybe I don't really No, you know it. Like you passed your classes, you did the work. So you need to sort of acknowledge that. And I also think part of it is you got to present that sort of stuff on your resume. Yeah. Right. Like you have, you cannot be afraid to be like, uh, in case you didn't know, I am awesome. Right. Like you really need to like, I have my students and women in management essentially practice bragging about themselves and they hate it because it's so <laughs> awkward to be like, let me just give you a list of why I'm fantastic. But ladies, you know, who's going to make that list? Uh, the dudes who interview for that job, right? Like when we talk about gender traits, like men are far more willing to be like, I did all this stuff. And women are like, um, I helped somebody 
do that. No, you did it. You like, you have to claim it. And I think that that's a really important sort of piece to getting into what is like right now, a very male dominated industry. And, and I would say, and also I think the Me Too movement has helped this and things are shifting. And we've just talked in my class about that recently, this norms cascade, where there is a little bit of a awareness more so now, but I would say women also have to be capable of calling out the bad behavior when it happens. And so do men. And men, men do too. I think yes. just across the board, <coughs> calling out the bad right. behavior is right. something that hasn't happened. There's a lot of, oh, that's just how they are. Yeah. No, well, how they are, he's a jackass. Like, and right. we're at work and that's actually not acceptable. No. And I think that those sorts of call outs need to be done in a more public forum, which is not how we typically do it, right? When people are inappropriate, what happens? Their supervisor takes them aside quietly yeah. somewhere. Right. And it's like, oh, we can't do that anymore. Well, you shouldn't have ever been able right. to do that, right? But it's got to be clear that like the organization as a whole will not tolerate this kind of behavior. And it's shifts like that that are going to be more welcoming for anyone who's coming into an organization from an underrepresented group. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and the whole idea of... I start, I've been reading a bunch of stuff on, um, it's called it's this idea of self-leadership. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to have a team under mm -hmm. you to be a leader. Like that is a skill set that you can develop right now. Um, and I think that that's really valuable. I think a lot of times people are like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not a leader because I'm not managing anybody. But you're going to have influence on everyone who is around you on your team right. and at your organization. And that is an opportunity to sort of build on those skills. Situational self-leadership. Yeah. Blanchard, Ken Blanchard, if you're familiar with any of that. But yes, exactly. Because you may be on a project. You may be a project lead, whatever it may be. And you can have, have influence. Yeah, there's like a, there's a bunch of stuff about essentially like leading from wherever you are, yeah. right? And taking advantage of that. So since we're talking about leadership, let's say uh, you're a man and you're working seeing little things like cultural things in the company where there's harass. Mm -hmm. What would you do? What's the what would you would you tell your manager? Would you if you saw it happen would, in a public place, would you call it out immediately? I would, How would you guys handle it as a as a manager? I would well I would say it's unacceptable. Yeah, I would call it out. What's trickier is if it's your manager who's being inappropriate. <laughs> yes. Then which then, happens. And so, you know, in, in these cases, you know, when you start at a new organization, they're going to tell you about what the process is. How do you go and report these things? And I think that what happens a lot of times is people see something and they just go like, maybe I, maybe I misread it. Maybe, maybe it wasn't what I thought it was. And they just swipe it under the rug. So right. would, you, would you follow the, the process of harassment files, complaints, all that, if the system was broken, if the manager was broken? Or were the you still have to document it, right? Like you still have to go through the system because otherwise it's yeah. never going to change. But I think this calling it out is. Yeah. And, and then it's a call. Ultimately, if you try and try and try, and then you realize is the ecosystem going to hear and is it going to learn and is it going to change? Or do you have to leave that system and go somewhere else? that's going to be more open to what it is that you have to say, right? And is it is a better work environment because ultimately I believe maybe again, I'm too hopeful. I do believe the truth is revealed in time. And I do believe these organizations are called out in time. It doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes persistent attention to it. Lawsuits. There's definitely yeah. lawsuits out there. Um, and it takes all of that. But then if you can't get the change within the organization by you calling it out, then you may have to make a personal choice and go somewhere else. Or if the organization is specifically resisting your change, right? right? I talk a right. lot in my class about trying to, trying to get a really good read on the culture when you're applying right. for jobs, talking to as many people as possible, utilizing your USD network. If you're going to apply for a job at a company and there are alums that work there, hit them up, mm -hmm. ask them to go out for coffee because what they tell you on their website and what they do may be two entirely different mm -hmm. things. Right. So 
So you've got to sort of understand that culture. And if you talk to people from USD and they're like, oh, no, 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 it's terrible, right? Utilize that. Then like you're, you're not going to go there and find a respectful environment who cares about you, who cares about the people that you work with, right? Like it's just right. not going to happen. And so sometimes trying to make the change in what is essentially a toxic culture, you're just yeah. beating your head on a wall. Right. And it sucks because you want to make it better, but sometimes you sort of have to, you got to pick and choose. Yeah. But don't you think sometimes there is a chance that over time, those mm -hmm. things will be revealed? Yeah. I mean, but it, but it takes time. It does take time. But if you're, but if you don't express it, then it's not, once more people continue to express it, then it's going to eventually get attention. And sometimes it's that that first person who's willing to be like, okay, I'm done. This is like, I'm absolutely unwilling to, to allow this to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. You report. And then all of a sudden, like 10 other people are like, oh gosh, thank goodness. You I did was that. so worried. I yeah. didn't want to do it. And like the floodgate opens. Yep. And now the yep. person who's been harassing everyone all of a sudden no longer works there. Right. And that's a, yeah. it's a big, it's honestly, it's a risk to take, totally especially risk. as mm -hmm. a younger, newer employee. But I think a lot of it is about you all thinking about what, where do I want to work? Where do I want to spend my time? Because once you get those full-time jobs, you're going to be at that job more than you're going to be with your family mm -hmm. or people you actually like. Um, <laughs> right. So you might as well find a job mm -hmm. filled with like people who align with your values. Mm -hmm. I think that that's just a really important thing to try and figure out, especially like right now it's interview season right? You got to do your homework. Yeah. And you got to do some casual online LinkedIn stalking um, and see who you can find and who you can reach out to, to really like get a read on the places that you think you want to be. And, and having said that, I think if you do have a challenging experience, you always learn from the struggle just as much as you learn. Sometimes you learn even more from the struggle than you do from that. What's going easy, right. Or going smoothly. So I think sometimes if you get into a situation where it's not so great as you thought it was going to be okay do what you can to address it try to change it if you need to make a change make the change and you probably learned a heck of a lot in that process so you're not going to let that be replicated somewhere else and you're going to have an impact that way i think a ripple effect and then quantify way. those skills that you just yeah. learned right. add them to your cv and go find a new job yeah exactly sebastian did you have a quite your hand up earlier uh, it was, it was, yeah, Okay. So it's 522. We probably have time for just like one more question. Yeah. If you have one, if not, we'll just like send you back out into the world to fix <laughs> all of the problems. All of it. Um, yes. And can we thank you both for that great question?